Hey, check out the fancy logo. Welcome to statisticalprogramming.net where we help you learn all the ways that programming can help you quantify, qualify, and generally predict your world. Today we're going to be learning basic commands from SQL, which is the language of relational databases. Now, if you plan to analyze data for a modern business, there's a 95% chance that the data is housed in a data warehouse, and sooner or later you'll have to retrieve it yourself. But SQL commands are not quite like any other kind of programming, so if you are new to it, there's nothing like a good visual representation of what each major command is doing. Let's get into that now. This video, and a lot of the learning material I plan to create, is based on a visual approach. When you visualize something, you're forced to create that thing using your imagination. And doing so will really tell you where you have a solid understanding and where you do not. Furthermore, as you create a visual model of what you're working with, you give yourself a clear reference point to relate to as you build more complex understanding. And that's going to work very well as we start with database basics. A database is a bunch of rows stacked on top of each other, or maybe it's a bunch of columns that are smashed together side by side. No one's quite sure. But what we can all agree on is that rows and columns each make up a table. Now, tables have some interesting properties, such as their primary key, which defines the granularity of the table, and also allows them to join to other tables. And speaking of the other tables, a collection of them is known as a database. And this is the thing that we can query with our SQL scripts. Since this is statisticalprogramming.net, what we're interested in is the ability to use the data in some environment outside of SQL, such as a programming language like Python, or even a simple XPREL spreadsheet. A cool feature of SQL commands is that they're very phonetic and that they describe a function well. So when I think of select, which is our first command that we're going to learn, I picture them taking items off a cart and placing it into my shopping basket. So let's look at how the select statement is written. The term select goes first and is always eventually followed by from, as in what table or tables should we pull from. Next, we need to tell which columns we want to select. In this video, I'm just going to refer to columns by their color as if that were their name. And the names in our example will be blue column, orange column, or green column. These will always follow the word select and always will be followed by the word from. Oh, and don't forget to separate with a comma except the last one. Otherwise, you will get an error. Next, we'll put the table name or names after the word from and we'll finally have everything we need to complete the most basic select statement. So, it'd be very limiting if we could only grab whole columns from our tables, as many databases contain hundreds, thousands, even millions of rows. The WHERE statement acts as a way to filter out rows you don't want to include in your results. For this example, I'm using the dark colored lines within the cells to re represent values. Notice the two red values in our blue column. Suppose this column refers to order status for some e-commerce site and dark red values represent cancellations of some kind, and we want them excluded from our select statement. To do so, we're gonna add where blue column does not equal dark red. Aside from does not equal, just as an aside, we could also use a greater than or less to than value, an equal sign, in or not in to filter out a group, or a few others. But we're gonna keep things simple with this does not equal statement. So getting back to it, it's important to understand that this has the effect of filtering the results before they are accessed in our query. So our red records here are gonna basically be filtered out before the rest of the data is selected. And this is what this is gonna look like kind of visually. The red records disappear and our select statement our data is now ready to be used in our select statement. So 
the where statement always goes at the bottom of the query. And our final statement will look like this. Beautiful. But wait, I thought SQL is all about querying databases, not just tables. It is. That's where joins come in. Adding a join clause to your select statement allows you to combine tables based on some common key. In our select statement, the join clause appears after the word from, but before a where statement, which we don't have in this example. We select from our first table and then add the word join followed by the second table we wish to pull from, like so. Then, to complete the clause, we identify the columns from each table on which they'll join. Side note, they don't have to be the exact same name. They just have to contain values that will match up with each other. The join works by matching exact values from one column to the other. Notice here that our red and green values are not physically matched on the same rows. The join will shift each row based on the value its join column matches up to. Watch the table on the right closely as the entire rows move to match the blue columns together. Finally, once the join columns are aligned, the two tables are merged together and then just like in the where statement, this merge allows the select process to begin. So while the join we just learned merges tables side by side, the union matches tables or a single column top to bottom. A basic example is a union statement sitting between two select statements. The union says that after the blue and yellow columns are selected from table one, they should be placed on top of the blue and yellow columns of table two. Notice we have the exact same column names. A union can only occur on tables with the exact same column names and where the columns being unioned have the same data type. So in the past, I've emphasized that a filter or a join happens before the select statement. In the case of this query, the select statements go first, followed by the union, which results in the two tables converging via their columns. The last SQL command that I'm going to go over is the group by clause. The group by is necessary in the select statement when there is a mathematical operation being performed over one or more of the columns but there also exists a column with no operation being done to it. The group by sits at the end of the query, followed by the column or columns that are not part of the mathematical operation, in this case, the blue column. In our example, this query performs the sum function over the green column with respect to the unique values in the blue column. You'll notice the values in the green column that correspond to the duplicate dark red and dark green values in the blue column will be combined and totaled together for our final result. This has been a basic walkthrough of the commands an analyst is most likely to use while querying from a database. Although each command represents a simple concept there are derivations of each that can become quite complex. Writing expert level SQL queries can involve many combinations of the commands discussed and can approach the skill level of actually an art form, but it's all based on the fundamental understanding of the basic concepts. Later videos will dive into each of these commands in more details and also some more advanced SQL strategies. Until then, Godspeed, and thanks so much for watching.